What I normally do is, this, this is quite a unique challenge for me, um, I usually do about two days as a presentation. So to do 20 minutes is quite a challenge. And in fact, I'm actually going to do five because I came up a few weeks ago and did a talk and actually managed to get to the end of my talk without playing anything that I'd actually brought up to play the audience. So forgive me if I'm going to ramble pretty quickly through what the Trebus project is, some of the issues that I'm involved with, why it might be relevant, um, just some stuff to think about. I studied art, uh, sculpture at Manchester. I used to work with dust and with sound and with increasingly with words. Uh, so I was kind of heading in the direction of the Trebus project before I met my first person with dementia. Some people think I came at it from a care angle. I actually came at it from an art angle. Um, I started visiting care homes about 15 years ago. I visited about 150. I've worked with a couple of thousand people with dementia from the beginning of their condition right through to the end. Some of them I've stayed with throughout. The, uh, I'm going to play you a piece. The second piece that I'll play today is with a guy that I worked with for nine years, uh, tracking change in his story, in his language. And also I've been trying to find, as an artist, ways to document these interactions that I have with people that felt relevant. I didn't just stick, there's this awful bloody fashion for making dementia poetry, of doing long interviews and cutting them down into tiny little things because some of the words sound a bit funky and a bit poetic. Um, that is garbage and it does nobody any good whatsoever. So if you see people on BBC One on the news saying, you know, poetry cures dementia, no, it doesn't. Um, I've worked with a diverse group of people. I've worked with the first woman on British television. I've worked with a member of the royal family. I've worked with politicians. But most of the stories that I've put together have been with everyone. You know, the, the road builders, the navvies, the housewives, the people who disappear into care homes whose stories and voices are completely lost. Most of the people who've told me their stories are women which is very interesting in itself um, because we tend to have, I think, sometimes a male perspective on history. And the Trebus project is very much, you know, three out of four people taking part in the project were women. Um, there is an idea that sometimes people with dementia, these stories are not really useful, that the information content won't be there, that they won't be, they're not worth listening to. And actually, the first story I'm going to play is very much worth listening to because it's just been involved in a court case. Um, people did actually try to get me to stop talking to people with dementia. There are barriers to working in care homes. A lot of them are absolutely right, but there's also a prejudice against listening to people with dementia. The presentation of people with dementia in the media is ridiculous. You know, people turn up on Coronation Street and die in three months, usually having had an accident. Well, dementia doesn't actually work like that. Or they're presented on, generally, the BBC News as victims of a global epidemic. There is no global epidemic. It's a mythology. They're not tragedies. The people I work with do not present themselves as tragedies. They're vibrant, interesting people who are continuing to live lives. So when I first started putting the stories together, I started working with A to Z timelines. I was born, I did this, I did this, and then I did this. Usually the memories ran out at the age of 24, and the person might think that they were 24, 28, something like that, when they were 80. But actually I realized more and more that it was important to include now as well as then. And the stories of people with dementia are not people stuck in the past, they're people looking at the present through an increasingly distorted and fragmenting lens. How you actually document that is a massive problem. So I've worked with printed material, I've published books, I've released records, I wish I could make the records skip automatically, but I can't. I've worked with film. 
Um, I've done all kinds of things, even working online, uh, putting the stories online. The Trebus Project has a website with about 50 of the stories. The archive contains about 250 stories at the moment, and I'm producing more all the time. So the first piece that I want to play, by the way, which I completely forgot about, that was the first story, by the way, when I had absolutely no technology whatsoever and was even presented from having a notebook in the care home. So I had to write them down on scraps of paper and sometimes even on my hand. And I collaged them together in a big scroll that was 28 feet long. And it's all made of fragments of text from interviews with one woman who we were told had no memory. So it's a very time intensive Palava. <laughs> this is Manuela Sykes. Manuela was on the news uh, a couple of months ago. She was admitted to a care home through self-neglect. She was incredibly difficult to work with. An ex-Labour politician uh, turned up at my house once 14 times in a day. God knows where she found my address. Um, she was incredibly confrontational, very challenging, very difficult. Uh, Westminster Council moved her into a care home for self-neglect and she took them to court because she wanted to go home. And the court case, she won. It's the first time in the world that's actually happened. The judge decided that her well-being depended on her being allowed to take the risk of going home. That even though she will probably die there, even though she will continue to abuse her neighbours and probably take a great deal of risks. She fell down the stairs once, she was self-harming. Her life as a political campaigner, somebody who always put themselves on the front line, must be maintained. That is what was important. She had no evidence of that apart from you know, her history of campaigning, but in terms of recent evidence, the only thing she had was the story that you're going to hear. So, they're about seven minutes long. My first memory, I remember looking across a great expanse of gleaming water in the sun with my mother. And that, I think, turned out to be Mexico. I must have been less than three years old. These memories are rock solid. This dementia, it's just the recent things that I can't hold on to. It's a nuisance. I can't hold on to the threads. My mother, my mother was beautiful. The most intelligent, witty and caring human being I have ever met. She was always helping other people. And all during the war, such an extraordinary person with extraordinary principles, a huge sense of humour, and rather risque at the time. We had much fun. Her mother was an aristocrat. She came from a long, titled line. She was half Dutch and half German, with a splash of Spanish, a dash of French, but my father was a Yorkshire man, and... He was very different from my mother. A great deal of male dominance. He didn't get away with it. <laughs> they evidently must have had a great deal in common at some point. I had a brother. He died. But he got married and had children and, and so on. And uh, just the two of us. I think probably he had a rather rough time because there were two dominant females, and he was the younger male. My father had left the house, but then when he went to school, he came home one day and said, boys are better than girls. They told me that at school. For quite a while, his attitude changed, and he tried to dominate, because that was the culture. And I didn't exactly throw him down the stairs, but, well, we disagreed. And... That was how the inequality came home to me. I realised that the whole of society was fundamentally wrong. And men, little boys are so badly brought up. All the bloody churches. The churches do the opposite of what Jesus said. 
Mary has chosen the better part, and it shall not be taken away from her. And ever since that day, men have been taking it away from her. All bloody men produce is a squirt, and that would be better bottled. I wrote about this in the newspaper. I got the most enormous mailbag. We make a point, I think, or we used to. I haven't examined it recently, of emphasizing the necessity of racial equality. Does this remain so? Well, why the hell don't they do it with sexual equality? Because they don't, do they? I was on the council. We were talking about this. I mean, this is a long time ago. I used to be a liberal, did I tell you? For a very long time, I didn't like the way the Labour Party behaved. They were very often as Tory as the Tories. And I printed what Tory means. To plunder for the sake of gain. When I wrote about vegetarianism, and more specifically the treatment of animals, my mother wept. She really wept. She studied dietetics and she thought I'd die. <laughs> Shows what dietetics were like in those days. I asked questions about meat and how they were killed and so on. Somebody said to me that you should go to an abattoir and find out. And I couldn't believe what I saw. And the way they were treated before they were killed, I've written about it bluntly. And I haven't hidden what I saw. I put some pictures in. And I got the most enormous mailbag. Very mixed. Whenever I think about those animals, I'm back. I can never erase that memory, however bad my dementia gets. But, but, but now I've seen people treated just as badly. People in care. People with dementia. Drugged and sedated with a cup of tea and a digestive biscuit. It shows contempt for the elderly. It's been like that for Jenner bloody rations. Dementia. I was told Mummy had it. I was told I would get it. I was told that it hits more women than men. And older people, and mostly women, they're marginalised and stigmatised and hidden. I'm very distressed at the way the subject is avoided. It is rare for a carer to have real integrity, and I should say this applies to the people that run the so-called care homes. If you examine the character of quite a lot of people involved in, quote, care, you'll find a lot of people involved in care are, are bossy boots. I did an article on that. Go and read it in the British Library. Forty years of it. I raised quite a mailbag. Most of it unprintable. They really were very angry. I'm blunt. I don't believe in wasting words. I had the experience of nursing mummy. I've seen what happens in the hospitals. Oh, I don't know about now, but I was never given a real understanding of what she was going through and why, or given advice on how best to look after her. Mummy thought I was potty because I read about vitamins and minerals and other things, and I think they've kept me going. I think I got my diagnosis about 20 years ago. An erosion of the brain. That was the phrase I used. On the brain scan, it looked like a golden cap across the side of my head. And I said, that's pretty, what's that? He said something like, that's your dementia. I left the hospital, came back here and carried on as normal. Well, as best I could doing mountains of other things. Why would I stop? Things pile up. I'm afraid I don't have time to tidy away everything every day. I've lived for decades like that, so things, as you can see, have piled up. Dementia, care, it's been getting worse for the past couple of decades. To make a change in care, we need to make a change in the politics of care. A, it's ignorant, and B, it's indefensible. Cheaper and easier. The problem is that a great many people 
have contempt for the loss of memory and the mental problems that that leads to and take advantage of it. They behave in the most diabolical way and they think they can get away with it because no one would believe the poor woman with dementia. It's online, that, that piece. It's that, that piece was read by Sean Phillips for uh, Radio 4. I did a programme called Ancient Mysteries. That was part of that radio series, but it was just hugely important for a number of issues to do with the fact that I wasn't initially allowed to name her. When I first put Manuela's story on the website, I didn't use her real name because that was the convention. You're not supposed to. And the more I read the story, the more I thought of what we were doing as was part of her whole history of putting herself on the front line of taking risks and that was really important to her and it was really vital that I was allowed to name her so I did and I kind of did it thinking no one would sort of notice and then I did a radio series and it got two and a half million listeners and of course that changed quite a lot so when it went to court her name was already out there which was a really big deal and that was a factor in allowing her to be named in, in the press, uh, getting Westminster Council named as the council that were trying to keep her in care. Um, it's quite a big deal. I really strongly recommend you go and listen to it because it's actually very funny as well as very moving. And she talks about her experiences of dementia and she had quite an advanced dementia even at that stage. So again, it went against that notion that we sometimes see on TV that people with dementia don't know they have dementia. She was telling me what it actually felt like and being pretty forceful about it. The second piece is, this is the guy that I worked with for nine years. Uh, his name was Sidney Lightfoot. I met him in a care home and he was already quite advanced into his dementia but he was actually able to tell quite a good story about where he came from and his life up until the age of about 30 and then it all started to fall apart. Because I worked with him for a long period of time and stayed with him, we were able to com accommodate change over time within his narrative. And then uh, for the radio program that I did, I decided to take just segments from his story to show how it had changed over time, to show the whole nine years of change. And what you get is this sense of a, a narrative where the elements are all, sorry, all still there, but they have begun to fall apart. It's not that the memories were lost, they were all there, but they've been recombined. In all the stories that, are, in a lot of the stories that I've done, trauma, plays a big part. People go on about the same traumatic experiences. In Sid's story, the issue of guilt comes up. It's not what he did, but what he didn't do. And that sense of guilt, he applies to people where he's not been there to help them. And sometimes their stories fuse. He talks about his mother and combines her story with his best friend. And at the end, he even begins to think that his friend was rather ladylike, because he's seeing her in some way connected to his mother. So can we play this? I, I really like, can, have we got enough time to listen to it? My mother, I don't know how it happened, but she toppled into the river. She was walking up a ramp on a ship. It broke and tipped her over backwards into the water. The tide was up and she was swept away. And they couldn't find her. She just disappeared. My mother was the lady of the district. Never outclassed. A pretty face with clothing for the centuries. She used to go shopping for the families of the dead boys. Clean their houses and their front steps. I often walk round those houses now. Just to have a look, because... The lads through the windows grew into men and grew into soldiers that went on the fields with me and they didn't come back. Frankie was my mate. We had, a, we had a hole in the garden fence so we could crawl through to each other. In the wartime, 
I went home one day and went down the toilet in the yard. And the garden fence was fast and shut. He was dead. God, it upset me. When I look back over the years, I sit quietly sometimes. I go right through the whole history of it and everything goes back to the beginning. The long line has got to stop somewhere. It all runs back into a film. It starts at the beginning with a baker's shop. <clears throat> Even as I am now and I'm in my 90th year, my thoughts still run back to the beginning. My school days. The boys that lived upstairs that I went to school with. When I'm sitting quietly on my own, it, it come back at night. I don't usually have any trouble with ghosts. They like me. Dad was my soldier. He got badly wounded. He spent the rest of his life crippled. We were walking through the streets one day and it, he had something in his hand and he turned round sharp and there was a bloke with a bayonet. He thrust it right through the centre of Dad's tummy. That put my poor old pop out of being a fit man for the rest of his life. My mother, she was a perfect angel. She was a diamond. I was just behind her on the ramp in the crowd. Eventually, she fell in the river. She was resting against a plank on a boat. And a bloke turned round and said something nasty and shot her in the stomach. And she fell backwards into the river. She was carried away and no one could get to her. I wasn't there. I, I was still in Norway. If I'd been there, I would have dived in and saved her. It's been there all the time for me ever since. The regret that I wasn't there when she'd been there for me. Ooh. Frankie was my closest friend and the most loyal person. He was killed in active service. He went into hospital because somewhere overseas a bloke stuck that bayonet right through his tummy. We got a telephone call, a uh, um, notification. I cried. C killed getting on one of the boats at Dunkirk. Nearly there, Frankie. I grew up with that boy from when he couldn't walk on his legs. You go right through your whole life, then someone knocks at the door and says, he's dead. Stabbed in the stomach with a bayonet. You just want to cut your throat, you know. I went home on leave. I went out and shouted across a garden fence. For the first time, nobody wanted to come to me. Sometimes I sit here and it gives me something to think about, going back over the different times, telling the story to myself over and over and over again. And it seems to me like, for some particular reason, the past people are always trying to attract my attention. Hmm. We covered some gang in the army, you and me. We was bang up there with bayonets. We returned the offer, put away the nasty ones. Bang up in the stomach with a bayonet, all face to face. It didn't take long for them to die. A lot of fighting between us. A lot of killing. Join in, because you had to. I used to stand back. I couldn't stand it. Who did I marry? Do you know? Do you know, I can't remember. It's not important. I've got a rock in my head now. My thoughts are just round the outside. My mum carried me through my recovery. She fell off the back of a boat. Quite recently this happened, matter of fact. Someone leaned on the plank and it cracked and she fell in the water and the tide carried her away. We couldn't get to her. The next thing... I put him upside down and turned him in the water. I swung the bastard over the side of the deck and I put that bayonet right through his tummy. It was a repayment. Is it true that I went to Japan? I don't think so. It's a long way from here to there. Frankie got killed. My dearest friend got killed at Ansar. I don't remember. 
I can't remember where Frankie got killed. He'd come home one day and he said he was killed. He, he's not coming home. He was leaning over the garden fence and he said he wouldn't be coming home. He'd be going back. He had an admiration for me that made me feel good. He was a bit ladylike. We got on so well together. I'm a bit worried today. I can't remember very much. My mother was an angel. She put me on the mantel shelf the day I was born and said, sit there. She was my angel. She died. She was shot, I think. A German shot her. She was cleaning her step and she turned round a bit quick and he shot her in the stomach. The archive of stories that I've put together is now supposedly the biggest of its type in the world. Um, it started just as an art exercise, as an extension of the work that I was doing as an artist, but it's actually used now by linguists studying the impact of dementia on language. It's used even by neurologists and social historians. Neurologists often looking at visual hallucinations, stuff like that, evidence for that within the stories. Because they've gone on for an awful long time, you can look at change over time and look for the first signals. Um, it's used extensively for carer and nurse training. Uh, so just interpreting the stories, spending time listening to them is actually often very difficult in care homes for a whole number, of, loads of reasons. But you can actually sit down and read this stuff online and you can kind of learn skills in interpretation and you can learn what's going on underneath the surface. So it's grown, it's grown in use. Uh, it's still continuing. I'm working on a new book at the moment. I've released a book two books, uh, a record, radio series. Um, each story takes on its own form and I look for a, a way of presenting it that feels right. Um, I try to just get down to an essence that is actually readable and understandable, but presents the person as they are. Um, they're uncensored. There's good things and bad things. Uh, the only stuff I've removed is a little bit of over-the-top sexual content. Um, but this is pretty much as people with dementia are, and it is a million miles different from the presentation that we normally see in the media. I mean, it's re really interesting at the beginning about um, who owns these stories, but also who has access to this technology. We've got one in four, one in five people in this country supposedly developing dementia. Half the care, well, more than half, 90% of the care homes I, I go into once somebody is through that door, they never come out again. Many of them never get visitors. Their stories, which are so important to understanding this inner world, are completely lost to history as soon as they're diagnosed with dementia. So it's quite an important thing. So can I leave it at that? Sorry, I've overrun. Thank you, Thank you.